What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Real Ones Canes podcast. I am the Beast Brian London. My co-host is Brandon O'Doy. You can follow us on all the socials. I'm at Miami Radio Beast. He's at Brandon underscore O'Doy. And please do me a favor. I know you're watching this on YouTube. You got to be because the YouTube numbers are skyrocketing. People are finding us there. They must love our faces, Brandon. We are two sexy guys. They love watching us. Uh, go subscribe to the audio podcast. That would really uh, make a huge difference. Yeah, look at Brandon showing off that lovely face. Uh, go subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts, the Spotify's, the Apples, the Amazons, wherever it is. Go subscribe to the podcast. But we appreciate all of you for uh, enjoying the show, no matter how you're getting it. Brandon, we have to uh, get into a few things. You're just back from the coaches convention up in Nashville. We'll dig into that in the second segment. But here we are. It is uh, January 10th, and um, the Miami Hurricanes got a commitment out of kind of out of the blue from a kid with two years of eligibility left. His name is Reese Poffenbarger from Albany. He is actually from, uh, he hails from the state of Maryland. He went to Old Dominion, did not get along with the coaching staff there, transferred to Albany, really got along with the coaching staff there, did come down to Miami, take a visit. Really bonded with Shannon Dawson. He said their personalities really clicked. He calls himself a gunslinger. He's going to he's gonna throw that rock regardless, which means you're going to get great throws, and you're also going to get some interceptions. Um, he's actually kind of mobile, to be honest with you. Um, he's kind of a project. But, you, but I had said this in, a, in, in the emergency pod I did the other day. Shannon Dawson kind of likes these, these projects. Yeah, he he's he sort of likes these unheralded kids. Um, he's probably a little bit excited that Cam didn't. I think he wanted Cam, but any offensive coordinator worth their salt and sort of who kind of – I don't want to say Coach Dawson has a chip on his shoulder, but he has the belief that his ability to develop quarterbacks is toward the top of the country. And so anytime you have a guy with confidence and you got a, a guy with tools – you know, you look forward to bringing him in. He's going to have to clean up some techniques, stuff you get away with in FCS. You're just not going to be able to get away with in the ACC. Gunslinger, he, he plays an exciting brand of football. There'll be no shortage of excitement in Hard Rock Stadium. I am concerned a little bit about some of the, you know, throwing points and whatever. He's super athletic. That's exciting. But to me, it's super curious because you kind of have a really athletic guy <laughs> that was already on your roster. He's just a little less experienced. And he ain't going to be more athletic than Ja'Curry Brown. And he probably ain't faster than Ja'Curry Brown. And he's not taller than Ja'Curry Brown. So no. he's just more experienced. So speak. I don't know what the philosophy was, but you do have to have multiple quarterbacks. And in that vein, I guess everything's fine, but I just hope that Jakuri was taken care of to the point that he doesn't get into the portal in the spring window because uh, they seem too similar to me. You talked about his height. He says he's 6'1". The reason why he had basically no offers other than Old Dominion out of high school is because he was 5'9". Uh, in high school, that will that will put the kibosh on a lot of offers from big time D1 schools. He, he's grown a couple inches, supposedly. Um, he's got a chip on his shoulder because of that. I love his personality as well. As we're talking about Reese Poffenbarger. Um, if this were 20 years ago, I would use the S word, but we, we're not allowed to use that S word around here anymore until the Canes go and win another national championship. That word has been banned from my lexicon and I don't want to hear it. It's the one that starts with an S. There's a couple of G's. It ends in an R. We're not going there. Uh, but he has that, uh, which I like. But here's here's the interesting thing, and this is my take. And we'll see if you agree with me or not. And I think I, I've been listening to some other podcasts, and this seems to be the consensus. Miami's starting quarterback at Gainesville, Labor Day weekend, 2024, coming up. Is not on this roster. Not yet. They're still looking. Now, this brings us to Cam Ward does not sign with an agent yet. And there's been all sorts of fascinating things going on there behind the scenes. Uh, Talia Tung Tungavailoa 
has the blessing from Alabama and Maryland to get that extra year of eligibility. The NCAA hasn't ruled yet, at least as of the taping of this podcast. I don't think QB1 is on the roster yet. I think Miami's been very, uh, in all the articles I read, Pete Thamel from ESPN, all the uh, about the signing of Reese Poffenberger, is Miami was very open with him and said, listen, we're not promising you anything. You can come in and compete. You know, you want to come in and compete for the job with Jakari and Emery and anyone else we may sign? Feel free. Come on down. We'll take the depth. That's kind of how I read this. This is a depth play. This is a building up your roster play, but this is not a QB1 play. I love that. I love that. And I think when you think about this guy has a lot of boom or bust potential. You know what I mean? And I think he's good insurance if Ja'Curry does decide to get in that spring window portal because you replace, you know, having him. And I think I'll say, I'll go on record as saying this now with, with the acknowledgement of what you just said, that he may not be, he may not have been recruited to be QB1. I will say, even if they go grab, and I'm ready to put the Cam Ward stuff to bed, like I'm over Cam. And and I, I don't, I think he's a good player, but I definitely don't think he's worth all of this discussion. You, you know I mean? You're acting like, I mean, we're acting in, in the Kane community like this guy is the second coming of Lamar Jackson. He's not. And so at the end of the day, I respect what he did at Incarnate World. I also know that he won about four or five games in the Pac-12. And I also know, I talked to one of his coaches. I talked to a Wazoo coach who I'll keep confidential because he didn't give me um, permission to, you know, openly. I didn't. I talked to him as, you know, a scout. I didn't talk to him as media. Uh, and I played both roles. I think you understand that beast. That's kind of a complicated yes, thing, but for sure. I don't, I'm not so media that I got to break stories. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The no, I get this, it. The coach agreed that he's good. The, the coach agreed that he's really good. He's talented. Um, But I didn't get the, and, and this was a coach on the opposite side of the ball from him. So he saw it. But he also said, I mean, shoot, that Pac-12 was loaded. You know what I mean? And, you know, you got to think, like, he might not have been – he was barely top five in his conference. You get what I'm saying? Like, with Penix, yeah. who had a forgivable game, a forgetful game yep. in, in, in the national championship. Bo Nix, you know. Um, you had D- um, D- DJ, DJ um, yep. Unglale. And, um, you know, you got, you got Cam and then also, um, you know, Shadur Sanders had a fair year until they couldn't keep him up, to, uh, you know, couldn't keep him off the ground. So it, it, that was not an easy league to no. be a quarterback in and he got some success. You, you wonder, you wonder if he's being overvalued and that's what it, I'm not saying the guy's not good. You have to be careful when you overvalue kids. But Miami, you know, whatever their construction is and their plan, I think, like, I, and I've said this before, Mario Cristobal and Shannon Dawson, more so Cristobal because Dawson hasn't been around, he deserves the benefit of the doubt because he's fixed a lot of things in a short period of time. Okay? So now – we get to see how they're going to take this QB room and how they're going to shape it. A lot of what happens with that room is going to happen outside of that room. It's going to happen in the training room with getting Emory. I still think Emory Williams is the best prospect for the future for this team. He's just not 100% healthy at this point. I think what he did against Clemson and what he did against Florida State and how he managed those games and how it wasn't too big for him. To me, you need a guy that is not scared, has just enough athletic ability, you know, to get, you know, first downs, pick things up. He's got to become a little bit more of a sure and a safer runner. He can't be as tight. Uh, I think that de- will develop over time. But uh, he's definitely a capable passer. And the thing about Emory that I like a lot, he makes good decisions with the football. He does not turn the ball over. 
And that's what you have to have. You know, Ja'Curry, he, he didn't play in enough games, I feel. He made one mistake. You know, I'll live with it for a guy that didn't play at all. That was not his fault. No. Um, no. But bringing this guy in, he can dunk a basketball. He looks like Johnny Menzel 2.0. It could be exciting, but I guess the thing that I forgot to say, but I want to make sure I say is he's going to have a package. I think this Reese kid is going to have a package in whatever offense goes forward, like whoever they bring in for a quarterback. The only way I can see that not happening is if Cam is the QB one. This kid's going to have a package if you bring in, you know, sort of a Tyler Van Dyke type quarterback that's more of a kind of a a sit in the pocket that. They're going to bring this kid in in packages like Michigan does with their backup. And yeah, sure. So I think this kid's going to play no matter what. I, I do want to throw this out there, and then we can get to how they handle all this. As we talk about the possibility that, you know, re, you know, I think Miami Hurricane fans were, are losing their mind because they're just looking, oh, we got some kid from Albany, and that's, that's your go-to? That's, that's what you got? And I I continue to try to say, well, listen, I I don't really believe that he's brought in to be QB1. They're still looking. And as we, if we go down that path, you know, if it's not right now, there's another 15 day transfer portal window in the spring. And there may be quarterbacks that we don't even know about who go through the off season here and get to spring and say, you know what? I want to enter the portal. I didn't want it before. I thought I'd, you know, stick around and go through the off season and see where I am. And now I'm not feeling great about my situation. I want to enter the portal. So there's another opportunity in the spring if Miami does not get another one here, if they're looking for another one, to do it again come in a couple of months. Yeah, no, and that's that's fully understood and fully embraced uh by the staff. And again, I you know, they, they all deserve the, the benefit of the doubt. I don't really understand this move, but, you know, I'm I'm going to wait until August to, to say how I truly feel about how they've handled this. I feel like there have been some misses. Uh, but again, if this guy isn't QB1 and you're still recruiting and he's a nice death piece to have, you got to remember, this is a shallow quarterback room. You know, before you sign Reese, And he's going to start classes next week because that's when classes start. You know, people move, the team moves in, all the newcomers move in on Sunday. That's how it works. So they're moving in on Sunday. They start classes on Tuesday the 16th. So this is happening. So when you open up class, your spring roster of quarterbacks is only an injured Emory Williams, a Ja'Curry Brown who's played three games in the past two years, and this young man, Reese, coming from Auburn. That's all you got. You got to go get another quarterback. But it goes back to the point I made in the last episode, which is my advice would have been put everything behind Ja'Curry. He's shown enough. Expect Emory to come back. Um, No, I, actually, a correction. You're going to have Judd. You're going to have Judd will move in on Sunday. You're going to have Emory, Ja'Curry, and then you're going to have Reese. So you got four quarterbacks. Um, you can get five. Numbers are funny. Um, if you want to have five scholarship quarterbacks on the roster. But, um, you know, it, 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 it to me feels like Ja'Curry insurance. That's what it feels like to me. Because if, if I buy, and I do, that they're still shopping, you're bringing in a guy with a lot of eligibility left, two years as a as an eternity in college football right now. Yeah. And he has a lot of similar skill set to a guy that's already on your roster. So for just for just just for the hypothetical situation, let's just assume that they enter August 2024. Uh we're getting ready for the season and there's five quarterbacks on the roster. Okay. We got QB1, whoever that is, we don't know yet. We got Reese, we got Chikari, we got Emery, and we got Judd. How do you handle that situation? Who's redshirting? Who's, uh, you know, who's QB1? Who's QB2? Who's QB3? 
I just that roster management thing is always in the back of my mind. Yeah, well, Judd's redshirting. We know that. Emory right. needs a red shirt because he's coming back from a tough injury, and you don't need to go out there. And you played him when he probably should have redshirted anyway, right? So those two are pretty much done. And I think that's why they're going to carry five quarterbacks. The fifth guy, if they bring in another guy to add to Reese and Ja'Curry, is going to be a one-and-done guy. It's going to be a guy that's leaving after, you know, after January. So that's what this is going to be. This is this is going to be a one and done guy that comes in with a lot of experience. Now, I think if they don't find that one and done guy, they they might opt to just stand pat at four and then replace Jacuri if he goes into the portal. And if he doesn't, um, you know, they'll go in with four, the four that they have. You know, it's, uh, you know, when you talk about they're going to redshirt Judd, obviously. Emery, you think, is going to get a red shirt. Well, now you look at so many situations, and you know you need three quarterbacks that are that are not redshirting, that are that are ready to go because of injuries. We've talked about this over and over and over. We saw it at FSU. You need three quarterbacks. So well, now Judd, Judd's available. It's, it's not... Yeah, but you would like to, if you could get through without having to go to Judd. If you could get through red shirting, red shirting him, and just have three guys that are that are active, uh, I, I think I think you can make that work. It gets a little dicey, but I think you can make it work. Yeah, I, I, and I said Judd. I meant to say Emory. Emory will be available. You get four games. You right. know what I mean? It, you just don't want to play him past the fourth. You know, and he's he's going to be the third guy. It's not like he's going to be, you know, QB1. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to take anything away from the kid. I like him. And I've said previously on this very podcast that I think he has the most upside of anybody. But um, I just don't know. Guys getting injured and coming back, it's always a different story. They, it, you're never the same. Sometimes you're better. Sometimes you're worse. It's, it, but you're never the same. So, especially the kind of injury that he had. I do like his moxie and his competitive nature, um, and I'm excited to see. But, you know, it, it's, it's, this, is the com- this is an uncomfortable conversation because it's not like we can say, oh, Miami has the quarterback of the future. Like, there's a lot of question marks. Now, I'm not saying that these guys are not the answer to those questions. It's just we don't have someone where we're like, automatically this is the guy you know and because of that we're going to be talking about this all off season which i wish we weren't yeah i mean so i'm going to take it back uh you know you had ken dorsey as as the guy right he i mean he led in you know what should have been almost basically three national championship teams and ended up winning one you knew rock berlin transferred in from florida you knew Ken Dorsey leaves, Brock Berlin's going to be your starter. That's the way it was going to go. Like, there was that, 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 that's the way they lined it up. You had no question marks about it. Brock Berlin was going to be your starter. He would get you through the next few years, on to the next one, right? Like, it, it, it made sense. This is, is not that. This is not a situation where you know that Reese Poffenbarger came in to be your QB1 for the next two years, set in stone. That is not this situation at all. Um, so you're right in saying that we don't know exactly how this is going to play out, and um, which is which is fine. It's it's actually good for us. It gives us material to do the next few months of podcasts with. Yeah, no, it's great podcasting because there's lots of conjecture and questions and answers and things that can be discussed. But it's it's not so much. I mean, we're it. We're saying it's like there's not spring football. So we're going to get a chance to see, you know, these two guys compete. And it will be interesting to see who takes the first snaps, you know, during the spring football season. I will say this. At the end of the day, um, you know, this is the situation that has to be solved in order for Miami to take the next step. Because I do feel like the quarterback position kind of held this team back a little bit last year. And I'm not going to put it all on TVD. 
but um, I think there's a fair amount of responsibility that that position played. And, um, you know, the offensive coordinator does, you know, share some culpability uh, in that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a team game. And so uh, the person taking the snaps usually gets all the fame when things go right, and they get a lot of the blame when things go wrong. Just look at Michael Penix and J.J. McCarthy. So that's all you need to know. Speaking of those two, we will uh, dive into the national championship game, get Brandon's thoughts, my thoughts on what happened as Michigan wins the national championship. Should there be an asterisk there? Well, also, Brandon was up in Nashville at the coaches' convention. I just want to pick his brain about what, the people up there were talking about as it relates to the sport of football. What was the, what were the big topics, all of that. We will uh, get to that and more on the other side. Don't forget, please subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get your podcast, follow us on all the socials. We will check you on the other side. Be right back right after this, on the real ones canes podcast. And we are back here on the real ones canes podcast. He is Brandon O'Doy. Follow him at Brandon underscore O'Doy. I am the Beast, Brian London. Follow me at Miami Ra- Radio Beast. Please go subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast, whether it's Amazon, Spotify, Apple, all of those places. And, of course, if you're listening to this, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is picking up steam, no doubt about it. All right, Brandon, you are up at the Coaches Convention in Nashville. Just what was the uh, what was the what some of the topics that were being discussed? What was on some of those guys' minds as you wandered through the halls of the uh, the Coaches Convention? What were the big topics that were going on up there? Yeah, a lot of coaches, you know, talking amongst themselves. I mean, the talk is portal. Um, you know, a lot of conversations around getting experienced athletes and kind of managing recruiting, you know, coaches are, you know, were asking me, Brandon, you know, because they know I have this hotbed platform, Brandon, who you got for me, you know, who are the guys out of the portal and, and different situations like that. So, you know, coaches are trying to get better. Coaches are trying to get better faster and they want to use experienced players to do that. And we can obviously identify with that uh, because the university of Miami is on a similar path. Um, you know, bumped into a few coaches that knew players uh, that Miami uh, was getting or Miami lost. And uh, so those were kind of interesting things. And just seeing the general camaraderie around coaches. I mean, these guys go to war every day, but they there's a lot of fellowship in this college coaching community. And uh, it's cool to see, you know, when they all get along. I got a chance to have a very brief conversation with Mike Norvell. Um from Florida State, he kind of made himself available to coaches sitting out in the lobby for a, a fair amount of time on yesterday. That's the kind of guy he is. You know, he's a humble guy, you know, very likable and relatable. And, and when they do well in recruiting, that's, you know, Kane's fans need to understand, like, it, he's good. You know, he's he's a he's a guy that people can buy into and believe in. It's because of his personality. And uh, they've done exceptionally well in the portal. And he was sitting in the lobby recruiting really hard and saw, you know, Coach Drinkwitz, Missouri, walk by me, Dave Duran in the ACC. Got a chance to see him. He's kind of a to-himself type of guy, typical Dave Doreen, you know, nothing to see really there. But uh, saw talked to a lot of personnel and GM types. You know, um, you know they're developing larger staffs. You know, the, the key is always recruiting when you talk to college coaches and you know, finding better ways to do that. Got a chance to meet with the Austin P staff. Coach Jeff Ferris, who was at Duke, went to UCLA. Very young guy, like 34, 35. Now he's a head coach and uh, bringing in a young staff, trying to make his waves, trying to make his name, you know. And, you know, it's just interesting to see how coaches approach being hired, hiring other coaches, how they're setting up their recruiting staffs, their you know, personnel staffs and, and all of the things they do. Got a chance to meet the new Florida DB coach taking over for Corey Raymond, uh, coach out of the, the the West Coast who was with the Chargers. Just a lot of, you know, shaking hands and not necessarily kissing babies, but a lot of, you know, <laughs> bumping into guys. And Kevin, I, I caught up with a former Canes coach, Coach Franklin, Jethro Franklin, ran into yeah. him. He's at Fresno State now. A lot, a lot of Can- former Kane coaches I ran into, so that's always fun. To see guys you covered, uh, old Jethro, you know, he's a, still a, one of the more likable guys that, you know, we've covered yeah. on this beat. So it was good to see him. 
Was there any talk about this, the whole, the, the portal timing and guys opting out of bowl games and and all this stuff that kind of happened over the last month that caused a lot of college football fans a lot of angst because you didn't know who was going to be on your team when it came time for a bowl game? No, honestly, I didn't hear a lot of coaches talking about that. I think they've come to respect that that's just kind of the nature of the beast. I think everybody in college football knows that that needs to change. There were a few conversations around that, especially as it relates to quarterback recruitment, uh, because you had guys that would have liked to be on their teams through the bowl game. uh, But just because of the portal and how the timing works, they had to go ahead and declare so they can get to the front of the line. And a lot of that has to do with sort of the NIL money that, you know, kids are seeking uh, when they make transitions. But, you know, coaches were just, you know, a lot of people talking about the schedules and they're hectic and they don't really get a lot of time off in anymore because, you know, they're either doing OVs for high school kids or OVs for portal kids, you know, which were this past weekend. And now they're r- jumping right back into, you know, the first semester of the spring and, you know, the spring semester. And they've got early enrollees that are coming on the campus and, Spring ball is just a month or so away. And, you know, that also is followed by the spring recruiting period. So coaches don't get a whole lot of downtime. It was good to see them kind of like, you know, relaxing. And trust me, a lot of the conversations I had with coaches had nothing to do with football. And that was cool to see coaches kind of let their hair down. A lot of guys in transition, you know, trying to move their families, doing all these things. People don't understand the coach's life is a super hectic life. You know, we put a lot on these coaches. We criticize them or whatever, but they make a tremendous amount of sacrifices. They got very busy lives, and they don't get, like, assistance, Not unless you're a head coach. Like, these coaches are doing these things themselves. They're planning moves. They're planning, you know, what school their, you know, kids are going to go to. They're trying to find a place to live and, you know, all of these other things that go along. So it's fun that Miami has a staff that is intact and is coming back. And you have a lot of people that are going to be able to sit still and are not trying to do all those other things. And I think you're going to see that pay off this season because everybody's coming back for the first time in this Mario Cristobal era. So you don't have any new coaches. Everybody's the same. And so coaches this time last year were all trying to move in. You had a brand new uh, running back coach and Tim Harris Jr. You had a brand new who was moving from Orlando, brand new, um, Receiver coach and Kevin Beard moving down from Toledo. You had a brand new offensive and defensive coordinator, brand new linebackers coach and D Nick, who was coming from Cincinnati, like just tons of transition. So transition can be tough. I know in the news business, I moved three times corporate moves. You know, I mean, I mean, you've, you're a guy that kind of been here since you went to college here, but yeah. I'm telling you moving around is tough and it, it can wear on coaches. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right. So the national championship game, uh, I thought it was I thought it was gonna be a good game. For part of it, it was a good game. The beginning of it, it looked like Michigan was gonna run away with it, literally, uh, with their third string running back, uh, you know, d- d- getting huge touchdown runs. Um, and then we saw Washington start to come back a little bit. Although I will say the entire game, I was kind of my son and my wife and I were kind of saying like Michael Penix doesn't look right. Like he's missing oh. some throws that nor- that I've seen him make over the course of a couple of years. Um, And then by the end of the game, I mean, he could barely stay upright. He was grabbing his side pretty badly. Would you, would you think of the game um, and uh, Michigan is the national champion? Penix looked hurt to me. Um, It it wouldn't surprise me if he was hurt the entire game, Um, but he definitely was hurt for the majority of it. Throws he's made all season long. He could not make the receivers could not make catches. They didn't do him any favors. His line couldn't block um, a a peewee line, a defensive line. They were terrible, Uh, and I say that politely. Um, But, you know, credit Michigan. I mean, they put so much pressure on Alabama. They made Alabama for once look like pedestrian in the the offensive line, so much so that Alabama's center got in the portal right after the game. Yeah. You know? So I, I think Michigan earned a victory. They did it the Big Ten way. I went to school in the Big Ten, super familiar with that brand of football. It's always been physical. It gets criticized for not being fast, but they were both. 
I thought Corm and the backup running back, you know, I believe his name is Edwards. I mean, they they yeah. they had really strong performances, and it was behind one of the best lines. You know, Sharon Moore called a pretty good game. He got – I say pretty good because he got away from the run a little bit. You know, J.J. McCarthy was majority mistake-free. He's a guy that comes out of, obviously, our tree football hotbed. So we're excited that he won. And, you know, you just talk about the resilience of this team. This is a team that's gone to the CFB the last three years. This is the first time they get to the championship game and they punch it through and win. So they know what it's like to lose. They they turned around a lot of losing to Ohio State. They're the first kind of Michigan class in sort of a decade or two that has consistently beat Ohio State. And uh, this is all the things that Michigan fans have been hoping for, you know, as one of these college football blue bloods. And all you can think is, as someone who covers Miami is, uh, when is their return to prominence happening? Because Notre Dame kind of has come back recently under Brian Kelly. You know, Michigan has now come back. Ohio State has made their comeback. You know, Alabama came back under Saban. Georgia has come back under Kirby. And, um, you know, you're just waiting for the University of Miami to get their chance. I would say this, though. The Michigan comeback didn't happen overnight. No. It was a it it was a process. So uh, if Miami fans are looking at the paradigm of how Michigan did it, it, it takes a bit. Um, speaking of how Michigan did it, uh, Jim Harbaugh was suspended at the beginning of the year, was suspended at the end of the year. Uh, we have sign stealing. And, you know, listen, no one is going to be out here and saying that uh, college football or college athletics is completely clean. But, you know, they, they, they're sending guys to other stadiums and all this stuff, whatever, uh, you know. So I, I just I wonder if when history looks back, are they going to put the asterisk on this championship by Michigan because of what they were caught doing? as it relates to cheating? I don't know. I think I think they will in some sense, but it it, it kind of feels like all the Connor Stallion stuff, which is still, you know, they still got to get charged for all that stuff. Right. And, and, and that's they still got to actually be found guilty of that. But I think that that stuff wouldn't have helped them this year because now everybody know they were doing it and they were accused of it. And so this year they probably had to stand on their own two feet and not to mention, you know, it feels legitimate as a championship to me because I mean, you didn't have your head coach for two big stretches of the season and you still won. You, you beat Ohio state and Penn state without your head coach, you know, with a guy that's never been a head coach and he's an offensive coordinator. And then you get into the CFB and you beat Alabama and, and and then you take care of a team that basically has been scoring 40, 50 points on everybody and you hold them to under 20. So it just feels authentic. It feels like this was just the best team. Now, hypothetically, people can say, well, they wouldn't have beat Georgia. Well, the problem with that logic is you play the games to the results. Georgia didn't beat Alabama, so we'll never know. And you could probably say that about every champion, that they could have lost to someone else on the road. But they won every game put in front of them, and they did it with great adversity and even questions about their coach going to the NFL. Uh, suspension talk and NCAA violations, and I just they still came out and won every game. So I'm impressed. So, but Yeah, I, I you know, listen, you, as a program, maybe I put the asterisk, but what I, I don't want to do is take away the play they got from each individual player because I thought uh, – uh, you know, their running backs, uh, one, two, and three showed a lot of moxie, but Corum is a, a, a beast. Uh, JJ McCarthy, um, you know, you had him at football hotbed. You had him on the UM campus. You, you, you know him really well. You know his family well. That dude is a winner. That dude is a winner. Uh, you can just tell that, right? You, you could just tell that the way he – and he's kind of a, a new type of quarterback um, if you follow what he's done on the mental health situation – how he's uh, yeah. meditating before games and he checks in with the sports psychologists, you know, during breaks in order to just make sure they're good. And they're, I mean, he's really, he's really adapting to like a new way of, of dealing with 
uh, with playing that quarterback position, which can be as stressful um, as any position in all of sports. Um, he's just a great kid. I, I just I just love a lot of their kids on their team. Let me say this about JJ. JJ is one of the most self-aware kids that I've ever come across. He and his family are some of the most positive people that I have come across. Like when I have his dad telling me, you know, it was such a good thing for him to be involved with Hotbed and thanks for everything you do. Like, and this is years later. I mean, JJ didn't need to come through us. He was going to be a star no matter what. But when you have people that are giving flowers to people that played a role, and that's consistent with everyone he's kind of been in contact with. His quarterback, right. Coach Greg Holcomb, you know, all the people at IMG, all the people at Nazareth Academy where he attended before he went to IMG. Like, everybody leaves there with positive impressions of this kid and this family. And they're affluent. Like, J.J., he could have jerk vibes and, you know, what, like, but he's just a general, they have a grounding that they've done with him. And, and they have just, I think he takes his NIL and donates most of it. Like it's, yeah, it, it's the kid is just different. And I mean, and nobody deserves to win more. He, he said before he got to Michigan, give us time. We're going to get this thing turned around and doggone it. He went out and freaking did it. This is a guy that stood there and watched TCU celebrate and internalized it. And he said, man, we're going to come back and we're going to be, you don't get kids like that anymore. That kind of leadership, that kind of, and that beast, that's what we're begging for. We're screaming for it. We yep. want that more yep. than anything. And that's why I said, and you, I want, I want everyone who subscribes to this podcast and everybody who sort of, you know, listens and, and, and gets our takes. Cause that's what these are. Like, we're not saying this stuff is fact, but that's why I want to move on from Cam Ward. I want a guy that wants to be a Miami Hurricane who says, you know what, this ain't easy, and I'm bringing this thing back and, and has the gut and, and has the ability, the wherewithal, and the work ethic to go out and make that happen. He said, we're going to beat Ohio State. We're going to come out there, be more physical. He, this, is the kind of, this is the kind of thing this kid has done. He literally has talked it, not trash, just very confident, and we're going to go out and do it. And it's done. So I'm going to relate this back to another former. Uh, this is a former Michigan quarterback. There's a there's going to be a uh, a documentary coming out about the Patriots. It's like all the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, coming out here soon. And uh, there's a quote from Danny Amendola. I saw that floating around. And 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 this is this goes back to the type of kids you want and the type of players you want. He said, Danny Amendola, wide receiver for the Patriots, said. Uh, we we worked for Belichick, but we played for Tom Brady, right? And that Michigan team, yeah, they may have listen. They they, they played for Harbaugh, and they they loved Jim Harbaugh, but they were playing for JJ McCarthy, right? Like that guy had that locker room, and that's the type of kid that you want here. At no matter what program you're with, you want that guy in that locker room that guys are playing for because. He's that type of kid. To some degree, Cam Kitchens was that guy. But, and I don't think you'll disagree with me, Beast, and no disrespect to Kitchens. It's something about that guy being the quarterback. Yeah. When it's from that position. And who knows? This Reese kid could be, the, he, he could, uh, he could, be, he's got a personality. I'll give right, him that. Right, yeah, for sure. Um, But. God, woo, it would be amazing to watch somebody like that walk down here because that's what this program – I can't remember a guy. I mean, it's it has to go back to your era. I mean, not since yeah, I've been it's, covering. It's, I mean, and, had a guy and, like even, and even like a Dorsey, right? Dorsey, like everyone played for him, but it was really Joaquin and Ed Reed that were the, the real leaders of that team. That guys, like when Ed Reed would like basically like – his shoulder is like, you know, hanging off his body. And he would just say, listen, I don't care. I'm going to play. You coming with me? Let's go. Like that, that was what guys were playing for was for those guys. Like Joaquin was all busted up. Hey, yeah, I'm out there. We're going to dominate. And guys were like, okay, if what, listen, if these guys are playing busted up, I'm in. 
Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be the quarterback, but there's, you know, it, it kind of sets up good if it is that guy. You just want guys that that get it and are humble and and just want to play for the love of the game and and people want to follow that. And you're right about. Listen, I take. Listen, if Cam Ward calls me right now and says, "Hey, Beast, I'm coming to Miami," not that he would, not that he has my number, I'd be like, "Hey, welcome to the program." But all things being equal, we know the type of kid we're looking for. Yeah, and uh, I don't think we found him yet. So yeah, we will see. All right. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right. Uh, We will definitely talk to you next week, but I'm sure there'll be news at some point because there always is. It never stops. Uh, And we'll keep our eye on the basketball teams. Uh, You know, Believe asked us if we would, if we get into basketball and we, and we will, we'll keep our eye on it. We'll just, we'll see what's going on down there at the, uh, at the Wasco center. They're doing pretty well. So both the men and, and the women. Um, So we'll, we'll keep our eye on that. And, uh, we will keep you up to date on what's going on. Lord only knows, uh, I, you know, I'm heading out to California for, for a family event. Uh, and I was like, should I bring my computer? And y- yes, because you never know. You never know. You never know what's going to happen. I'm heading to Atlanta for an event. And, um, yeah, yeah, I, I saw that. I have my laptop. Yeah, yeah. No, you. I mean, listen, Brandon talked about coach's life being uh, hectic. Go, go walk through the life of Brandon O'Doy with 78 jobs and – Camps and clinics and games and uh, uh, you know all of that. Stuff. My son's birthday today. Shout out to my son Caleb. He turns ten. Happy birthday, buddy! Double digits. It's the big time. All right. We will. Uh, on that note, we'll uh, we'll check you next time. Make sure you go subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. We'll see you when we see you on the Real Ones Canes podcast. Peace. <laughs>